Thank you very much. I want to start by going back to when I was 18 years old. It's 1963. And I was an apprentice technician at the Royal Marsden Hospital in Fulham Road. And I can't remember exactly when it was, but some t one evening that year, I was watching the television, and there was a documentary about the Palestinians in refugee camps. And I'd never heard about that before. And the next day, when I turned up at work, as we sat around in the coffee room in the morning, about 15 technicians there, everyone was saying, I didn't know about that. I literally, there was no one in that room that knew that Palestinians had been driven off their land and, you know, over a decade and a half later, still mainly living in refugee camps. What my generation that grew up after the war was told was a line repeated again and again, that for, let me just try and get it right, a people without a land for a land without people as though no one was living there. That's what we were told. It was just a terrible old desert. The, you know, the Jews had gone there and transformed it, and now we're eating their Jaffa oranges. I, literally, I, if you think of the, last year, all around the world, people saw the Rohingya Muslims being driven out of their land, 600 and, uh, 650,000 into refugee camps. It was an intense debate on every uh, radio and television programme. Politicians have denounced uh, the leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, for not doing anything um, to stop that horror. But of course, back in 1948, there weren't thousands of uh, camera crews running all around and filming what was happening in Palestine. And I think one of the things we've got to recognise is that there are still vast numbers of people on every country, in every country on this planet, who have no knowledge of that history. And uh, people that try and raise it, as you just heard, tend to be a bit denounced. Eh? And you know, most politicians just say, it isn't worth all the pain and all that we're going to get uh, that comes from this. But I believe it is time to start making certain people know about their history. Eh? That eh, what we saw eh, were appalling acts of terrorism. I, how many people living in Britain today know about the bombing of the King David Hotel, which was Britain's uh, colonial headquarters, which was blown up by the extremist wing of the Zionist movement with over 90 people killed? And the person that oversaw and planned that went on to become the Prime Minister of Israel um, a, a, about 40 years later, Yitzhak Shamir. And if British troops had caught Yitzhak Shamir, they were looking for him, they would have hung him. I mean, it was a crime. But you then had world leaders all shaking the hand of Shamir and everyone just forgetting about these horrors. And that's, I think, a big part of the issue here. I, if I think back to the, the first sort of 35 years in Israeli history, broadly left of centre political leaders and people uh, who uh, had come out of a sort of slightly socialist political background. But now, of course, we have the most horrendous government in Israel in its history. A Netanyahu, a unbelievably right-wing, not prepared to lift a finger to make life easier for a single Palestinian. And I am certain, a, in his heart, he wants to see, a, he would like, to drive the remaining Palestinians out of that area. And will, can this ever bring peace? Of course it can't. And if you look at the shift in Israeli politics, I, I would have had major disagreements I, with the, the, the previous Israeli governments. But back in the early 90s, there was finally an attempt to reach out and start down the road towards a two-state solution. Uh, with Rabin, a, who was guilty of some pretty bad crimes uh, at the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, was one of those military commanders driving Palestinians at gunpoint out of their homes and marching them uh, over the border. But he had the courage to recognise 
after a lifetime in Israeli politics that Israel was going nowhere if there isn't a solution that's acceptable to Palestinians. And therefore, there was the picture of him shaking the hand of Yasser Arafat uh, on the White House lawn. But what happened? I mean, virtually uh, just a few months after that first stage in the deal, one of Netanyahu's party members on the extreme wing of his party assassinated Rabin in order to stop that process. And sadly, the successors I mean, didn't have the courage or confidence to carry on down that road. And now you've got a government that has alienated Jewish opinion all over the world. Before Netanyahu came to power, in Europe and America, over 70% of Jewish people identified themselves as Zionists. That figure's now fallen to about 50%. Because it's very hard to look at that government, not just the awful things he does to the Palestinians, but the corruption around that government. And I do hope some of these investigations are going to come uh, to some conclusions soon. Uh, the simple fact is, I, we've gone through 70 years of this. And I mean, although I was only three at the time, uh, when it, Israel was created, the Labour government at that time did not vote for the partition of Israel in the United Nations. But bizarrely, the Soviet Union did. Stalin took that decision. America did after a, a, a quite a balanced uh, debate. I, but our foreign secretary, under that aptly Labour government, Ernie Bevin, warned that if you partition Palestine, it will lead to instability and violence. And 70 years on, we are still um, living with that legacy. In these seven decades, there's been a, a war virtually every decade of horrific um, consequences. And does any Jew living in Israel wish to continue with that insecurity? There has to be a reach out um, to a solution. But part of the problem in all of this is uh, the fear that if you raise these issues, you're going to be demonised. I, I, when I became, I, mean, I first met Palestinians when I was hitchhiking through North Africa in 1966 and we got to Algiers and just happened to walk past the PLO headquarters and we popped in and talked to them. That was the first time I'd ever met a Palestinian. And when I became the leader of the GLC in 1981, I allowed Palestinian refugees living here in London to hold meetings at County Hall. I was denounced as anti-Semitic for allowing people to hold a meeting, you know. Um, and uh, we organised a, a, a cult Palestinian cultural event at Camden Town Hall. And as people came in, there were basically a far-right supporters uh, of uh, the Likud party on the other side of the road, screaming, demanding it be stopped. And it was simply a cultural event. And so all my political career, I have had to put up with this. I Literally, I think one of the worst things about the way in which people are demonised as anti-Semitic for raising the issue of the Palestinians is it undermines the importance of tackling real anti-Semitism. The opinion poll uh, a few years ago showed that 9% of people in Britain have some degree of anti-Semitism. I mean, the poll also showed that in France it's 38%, so we're, we're a, a lot better off. But I mean, in the eight years I was mayor, anti-Semitic attacks recorded by the Metropolitan Police were halved. In Boris Johnson's eight years, they more than doubled. Because my view as mayor was this is um, a city of most of the most diverse if not the most diverse in the world. And we put on events that showed what it is to be a Muslim, what it is to be a Jew, what it is to be a Hindu. I, we actually tried to you know, get people to understand better the diversity and differences of groups. And I find it very easy to do that because I've been an atheist since I was 12 years old, so I'm not particularly committed uh, to any particular religion. It's allowed me to work um, with all religions, and people should have the right to support the faith they want. But... That demonisation, of course, we were still in the midst of the latest attack. If you think back uh, to April the 28th, I was being interviewed on uh, BBC Radio. I was asked what Hitler did illegal. And I pointed out, well, there were two phases. In the 1930s, he signed an agreement 
uh, with the German Zionists. And then uh, he, uh, in 1941, we think, and changed the policy and went for genocide. And three, eight, no journalist phoned to ask about this because you only have to go on the Vad Yashem Holocaust Memorial website. There's a very long, detailed article about that. Um, or you could um, look at the um, Francis Nicosa, who's the professor of Holocaust studies at the University of Vermont, who spent over 40 years studying and writing about uh, the 30s and the 40s uh, and the Holocaust. And he spells out in great detail uh, the support there was in Hitler's government for Zionism in Germany because the Zionists wanted to move all Germany's Jews uh, to Palestine. And over that period, uh, they moved something like 60,000. And when the British government, just before the Second World War, banned any more Jews going to Israel, it was actually German, the German uh, government that helped the German Zionists hide away on boats leaving Hamburg, and another 10,000 um, German Jews um, got in there. So that was a real period of collaboration. That doesn't mean to say Hitler liked Jews. He loathed and feared them all his life. But this was what he saw as the way of getting out of that. And anyone who you know, just checks the history will see this is true. But then three hours later, you've got the Labour MP, John Mann, screaming, I'm a Nazi apologist, uh, and saying, I, claiming I said Hitler was a Zionist. And this was taken up by the media. Um, screaming, I mean, you, you, most of you will remember him screaming at me as I'm walking up the stairs. I think he was hoping I might hit him um, or something like that. Then they'd be able to expel me. And I'm then suspended from the Labour Party without anyone phoning to ask what I'd actually said or checking it out. And I'm surrounded by journalists for days. And I say to all these journalists, have you checked what I said is true? One said they had. I said, well, when are you going to um, put this out? Oh, I can't do that, can't do that. And this is the situation. I, you can't have an honest and open debate if anybody who actually talks about the history of what's happened to the Palestinians is denounced as anti-Semitic. And when you look at the, the scale of abuse, you can understand why most politicians just think, I'm not going to touch this issue. And so how do we get a solution? <clears throat> I, I remain committed to the two-state solution because that's all we've got. I, I would rather see one state in which Jews and Palestinians live peacefully side by side, and the Jewish community is such a dynamic one. I, I'd actually like to see something like a sort of common market of the Middle East. So many people in the neighbouring Arab states live in the most appalling poverty, and a, a, a common market in which the dynamism of a Jewish business leaders was having an effect would be a great way of lifting people out of that, and as it did in Europe ending all the prospects of conflicts and wars. But we've got to have an honest debate. And as I say, the, I think the majority of people in most Western countries know virtually nothing about this past. Now, one of the debates at the moment is, should a boycott of Israeli goods um, go ahead? And there are people that are practicing that. All I would say was that I spent decades boycotting South African goods during the years of that apartheid regime. I, but I have to say the boycott, although it was, I mean, lefties all around the world were advocating it, it had a minor impact, if uh, even that, on the South African economy. What brought an end to the apartheid regime was after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, the American government, which had been propping up South Africa because it was a, a military ally, it controlled a, a key a part of the oceans where a, boats are going from the Atlantic through into the Indian Ocean. A, the then President Bush, Bush the first, not the nightmare son, a, basically pulled the rug out of support and immediately the South African government a, had to negotiate um, to get a, a shift um, effectively giving up its own power and handing that over to the black majority. And that's what we've actually got to look at. The support of the American government for the state of Israel is massive. Three billion dollars a year in military support, weapons and so on, as well as a very good trading uh, agreements and all of that. And therefore, what I think we need to get across to people in America is 
what the truth is about the past and what is going to be done for the Palestinians. I think once people begin to hear the stories, I, and I've read a few books of people who are writing about seeing their parents driven out of their homes in 1948 and forced into refugee camps. There's so much data out there, such a, so much of it so moving. I mean, that's what we've got to get across to people. And one of the great surprises that many um, journalists had was how well Jeremy Corbyn did in the general election last year. And one of the biggest factors in seeing Labour's vote rise by more than at any time since 1945 was his campaign team over the internet directly reached out to young people. I, Jeremy knew, because he's been demonised just so I have all my life, I, that he was never going to get his message across in papers like the Daily Mail or the Sun and all of that. So the internet was used to get the truth about what Jeremy was saying across to hundreds of thousands, most probably millions of young people, and it mobilised them, and it was the highest turnout of young people in an election for decades. Now, if Jeremy could do that and get the truth about his programme across to people, I believe that's much more important than talk about a boycott. That's what all our groups and organisations should be doing through the internet, educating the world about our past. If we do that, it will start to put pressure inside uh, the United States of America, their political structures, and we will perhaps be able to get America start to put the sort of pressure on Israel that it did put on South Africa at the end of the Cold War. Because I have to tell you, I, I'm not at all certain we'll get there very far with Donald Trump in all of this. I mean, he's undoubtedly the worst president of my life and most probably the worst president in America's history. I, but no, I suspect there's only three more years of Trump, I, thank God. And what we need to see is an honest and open debate. Everybody in America, whether they are supporters of the State of Israel or supporters of the Palestinians, they want to see a peaceful solution. They don't want this to go on. And that means we have to pick up a, where a, we were what, over 20 years ago, um, the deal that Rabin did with Yasser Arafat. And that was absolutely crucial. And if you think back to that, a, think how Yasser Arafat was perceived in the global media before that deal was done, before an American government thought it was worth trying to get that deal. I, I was at the Labour Party conference, I can't remember now whether it was 1980 or 81, when for the first time ever we had a resolution saying that the Labour Party should recognise Yasser Arafat's PLO. And it was the most intense debate. I remember seeing Israeli embassy officials lobbying tr trade union leaders to cast their block vote against this. And it, we won that vote by one-tenth of one percent. And the, it, the vast majority of Labour MPs weren't prepared to, to go along with that at all. They were scared. If they recognised Yasser Arafat's PLO, they'd be denounced as anti-Semitic. But then, 15 years later, there he is on the White House lawn, shaking hands with the Israeli Prime Minister. So however difficult things seem now, in politics, anything can change in any direction. So let us educate the world. Let people know what happened in 1948. And you don't have to invoke Palestinians. You can invoke members of the Israeli government in the 1950s. There's a very good and very lengthy uh, biography of Moshe Sharap, who was effectively uh, number two in the Israeli government and was their foreign secretary. And again and again at cabinet meetings, and the minutes record this, he would say, we have to deal with the issue of the refugees. Some must be allowed to come back. Others must be given uh, proper decent settlements elsewhere. And every time a Ben-Gurion, who was the prime minister, would just dismiss this and say, no, we have to maintain a military strength when we, so that we can always defeat our opponents. And that broadly has been the strategy that's come along. And uh, Sharat was eventually forced out of office um, in the run-up 
to the invasion in 1956 because he would have opposed that. Um, so there were Israeli politicians who'd been at the centre of Zionism uh, all their lives who recognised there has to be a deal. And there, I'm sure, are still many politicians who may not dare to say it at the moment, given the, the climate of opinion in Israel, but believe that. And so let's, over the internet, educate and then have a debate and start to mobilise the pressure so that we will one day have an American president who threatens to pull the rug out from under Israel if the Israeli government isn't prepared to finally do that deal, which will give Palestinians the right to live like every other free peoples in their own country. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.